So tonight we're in John chapter 13. And as we are turning to John 13, I want to share with you the, the title of this. It's The Eternal Love of Jesus. You know, as we are embarking the evening before Thanksgiving, we can honestly think about all the things that we're thankful for. Many of us will spend time tomorrow with family and friends and, and loved ones reflecting on how we are thankful for the many things that Jesus has done in our lives. And so as we are celebrating Thanksgiving, I wanted to give our church a reminder of the very thing that we need to be thankful for, and it's the love of Jesus Christ. And not only is it his love that sets us free, it's his eternal love that transforms our lives. And I think a lot of times we go through this Christian life and we often forget that it's through Jesus' love is what drives us to serve him. And this evening, we're going to take a look at this beautiful picture of the eternal love of Jesus Christ and how this applies to our own lives. So, Lord, we ask that your hand would be in this teaching and that you would speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. In John chapter 13, beginning with verse 1, and I'll read to verse 3, it says, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And, having, and supper being ended, the devil having already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given him all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God. There's so much packed in these first three verses. What I want to do is little by little unpack these, unpack these verses and see how it transforms and sets us up how we are to live as Christians. You know, there was a time in my life, you guys, where Thanksgiving was not a good time for me. It was a time where I was alone, I was addicted, I was strung out. Matter of fact, when we were singing Overcome just recently, just right now, it took me back to a place where, uh, where I was in a hotel room alone. And it was, it was one of those times where I contemplated taking my own life because the, my addiction in my life was so severe that I had isolated myself. And I had pulled myself away from family. And it was the Wednesday before Thanksgiving that I knew people were going to come over. I knew my family was going to have a gathering. But yet there I was alone, strung out, and didn't think I was going to make it. And I'm thinking back to that today, where a lot of us can have this same response, but God God has delivered us from a lot of different things in our lives, and he's prepared us because of his love for us is eternal. And at this time, the idea of being loved and being thankful was something that was very far from me. I never thought I was good enough to be loved. I never thought that I would be in a place where I could be thankful. Especially in that lifestyle, I definitely didn't deserve the love from family or anybody else. And it was my own choices that had left me in this place where I know that I was unworthy of love. And in our passage tonight, we get a glimpse of the last intimate time that Jesus is going to share with his disciples. It is a great demonstration of love before his ultimate demonstration of love at the cross. And so we see here right away in verse 1, we're given a time frame. John starts this after this verse off with now. Now before the feast of the Passover, we all know that the Passover was a, a celebration of when the Jews or the Israelites were led of, out of captivity in the book of Exodus from the enslavement of the Egyptians. And it was at that time in Exodus chapter 12 where Jesus instructs Moses to tell the people to get a Passover lamb and to kill it and to take the blood and pour it on the doorpost with hyssop, hyssop and the Passover angel or the Passover, the angel of death will pass over that house because it was covered by the blood of the lamb. 
And so the Israelites always commemorate or celebrate one of these major feasts. And it's in celebration of the atonement of that lamb that, the, that they were passed over to escape the angel of death. They were delivered. And we know that Jesus is the ultimate sacrifice that atoned our, his, our sins with his blood. And it's the night before the Passover. The Passover is a time where they would have a meal between Thursday at sundown and Friday evening, according to the Jewish calendar. It was a time where they slaughtered lambs and on the Day of Atonement, and Jesus and his disciples were going to celebrate Passover together. And in verse 1, it also tells us that his hour had come. Now, what's interesting about this is that this was no surprise to Jesus. He often referenced his hour throughout the, throughout the book of John. It was no surprise to Jesus that his time for the death on the cross had finally come. He knew that he was going to endure a bloody death on the cross. And this was the day before his crucifixion, which fell on the 14th of Nisan, the time of Passover. More than any other Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, John emphasizes the fact that Jesus was on a heavenly timetable. As he did his Father's will, in John chapter 2, verse 4, he says, My hour has not yet come. In John chapter 7, verse 30, he references his hour also had not yet come. And in chapter 8, verse 20, again, we are told that his hour had not yet come. And in John chapter 3, verse 23, it tells us that the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. And here in John chapter 13, verse 1, Jesus knows or knew that his hour had come. This hour, what is this appointed hour? It was the time that Jesus would be brutally crucified for our sins, so no longer do our lambs needed to be atoned. We had the Lamb of God who will atone our sins with his blood. It was that very moment when Jesus would pour out his blood and his love on the sacrifice of of the cross that we may be set free, that we may be have life in Jesus to demonstrate his ultimate love for us. And it tells us here that, and alongside that his hour had come, here in verse one it says that he would depart from this world to the Father. Now this is interesting because when he speaks here of departing from this world, Jesus is speaking of his resurrection. He's speaking of his ascension into heaven, that he would leave this world to return to the Father. Now, when you look up the word world in the original language, we get the word cosmos. And it's not so much the globe that we're talking about, rather than the world system that it operates in. That Jesus was going to leave this time, this world system, to ascend to the Father eventually for us to receive the Holy Spirit. He would leave this world. So we get the English words cosmopolitan, which is a citizen of the world. And I found this interesting. We also get the word cosmetics. Now what's interesting here, young ladies, is that it's those things we put on in order to bring out of chaos. <laughs> that may ring true for some, but I'm not looking at anybody. So Jesus is leaving this worldly system. He's going to leave here, and he's speaking of the resurrection. And what the writer of what John is doing here is now he's building up Jesus' deity in these first three verses. Because the next thing that he tells us, it says that he loved his own. Having his, loved his own disciples who were part of this world. says that he loved them to the end. Jesus loved those who believed in him and he readied them for his mission in the world. The word love here, it's, it's an interesting word because we know the love that Jesus offers is agape love. There is no higher form of love than what Jesus is speaking here, a love that is the utmost highest love that anybody can ever offer. 
we often, often know that agape love is a sacrificial love, a love that would lay down one's life for his friends. But it goes beyond that, friends. His love, agape love, is eternal in nature. When the Bible tells us that God so loved the world, it's not in a present tense form. It's telling us that his love for us is eternal, that there is limitless boundaries on his love. But I think a lot of times from our Western thinking perspective that we have a hard time understanding what this love is. And the only thing that we can demonstrate this is by using the word love. Now, it's interesting. Here, we love a lot of things. We love pizza. We love chicharrones, tamales. We love TV. We love a lot of things. And this is what sometimes makes it so difficult for us to read from a Western perspective because we tr substitute the word love for so many things. But when you look at this in the original language, it says he loved his own who are in the world. That type of love there is the highest form of love that anybody can have. But yet again, that's hard for us to measure because we love so many things. But we get a glimpse a little bit of this in their next part of the verse one, where it says he loved them to the end. This is an amazing verse, you guys. Verse one, again, is, un, is unfolding the deity of Jesus to set us up for the rest of the chapter. Having loved them to the end. The extent of Jesus' love for his own was to love them until his death, but his love was preparing them for, the, for his death and resurrection. But what's interesting here is that he loved them to the end. To the end of what? To the end of his earthly life. But that love is limitless and extends into eternity. He had boundless love for them. It is a love that it has the full extent and the utmost love for them. A love that is eternal. Now, I don't know if we understand what an eternal love is. I don't think we've ever experienced an eternal love until we have a true identity in Jesus Christ. He would prove this by continuing to love them until he died on the cross. You know what's even more amazing, guys, is that he continues to love us now, and he's in heaven. His love for you and I is eternal. His love for us has no boundaries. It has no flaws. It has, it has no limits. His love for us is so pure in the highest form that we have a hard time understanding how to measure that. The closest love that I think I can receive of that is the love of my wife, the love of my children. But oftentimes, my friends, I still feel that I'm undeserving of that love. Jesus' love for you this evening goes beyond the death of the cross. His love for you this evening is eternal. And it will always be eternal. And when we are able to understand and walk in that, our lives can be transformed. I love what it says in Jeremiah 31.3. It says, the Lord has appeared to me, uh, appeared of old to me saying, yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. So Jesus loves his disciples without limits. He loves each and every one of us without limits. Jesus has come to this earth to die for the sins of the world. And he had paid it for our sins at the cross. Jesus loved us because he didn't. Jesus loved us not because we're so lovable. It's true that some may be more lovable than others. But from God's point of view, there is no, nothing lovable about a sinful person. He loves you because it's his character to love. I love what it says in 1 John 4, 10. This is love, that we are loved, that we, that not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. So God loves us. That is his own character. Now, if I were to survey all of us here this evening and have you all come up here or pass a microphone to you, and I asked you, does Jesus love you? What would your response be? Yeah, he does, but 
Well, yes, I think he does. Well, sometimes I think he loves me because there's so many bad things happening to me. How can God love me if he allows all this stuff to happen in my life? It's his character to love us. And he loves them to the end just as he loves each and every one of you. Do you truly understand that Jesus loves you with an eternal love? Do you really understand that his love for you is limitless? His love for you has no boundaries. His love for you is eternal. See, I may love my wife. I, I may love my friends. I, I may love a lot of people, but in that love, there's limits. In that love, there can be boundaries that will limit how I love, but Jesus loves us eternally. And the next thing that the writer, that John tells us in verse two, he tells us that supper being ended. Now, there's something I wanna point out here and develop just for a few moments, you guys. We just seen in verse one where John tells us that he loved them to the end. And then in verse two, it tells us, and supper being ended. Now, John has given us a play of words here. Because the word end in verse 1, having in love them to the end, is a different word used than the word supper being ended. There are two different Greek words with two different meanings. And what's interesting about the, one, the, love, the love to the end in verse 1 is that it's eternal. There's no time frame on it. Yes, it's, on an, it's ending on an earthly level, but extends into eternity. And here in verse 2, and supper being ended, is another Greek word that's totally different. It indicates that there is a temporary time frame to it, that it's going to end. That is, uh, it's going to, it's going to speak of a time that's temporary and has an expiration date. See, the love that is spoken in verse 1, love them to the end, speaks of a love that is eternal. The love of Jesus Christ is limitless. His love for you is ongoing and everlasting. It is Jesus who is eternal. He loved his disciples and he loves you of his earthly ministry that stretches way into eternity. But when you look at this event of the supper being ended, it speaks of an event that's temporary. It speaks of, a, of an event that has an expiration date. Even though this supper has great significance and great meaning, it still ended. And I think a lot of us pursue those things that are so temporary. We try to fulfill, make, bring fulfillment into those things that have an expiration date. We try to bring those things in that would try to bring fulfillment in our lives, such as the pursuit of money, recognition, relationships, we're in the pursuit of these things, but they can never bring fulfillment as the eternal love of Jesus Christ. But yet we are so often and so bent looking for these things. See, anything that we experience on this side of heaven will always have an expiration date. Tomorrow, a lot of us are going to be eating. But tomorrow evening at 11.59 p.m., Thanksgiving is about 10. And then we're going to have Christmas Eve. That's going to end. And then we're going to have Christmas morning. Guess what? That's going to end. See, and so many times we put our hopes and our fulfillment and our desires for fulfillment in those things that are temporary. And what John is telling us here is that Jesus' love is eternal that brings fulfillment and that this supper has ended. Anything that we do that is outside the eternal love of Jesus Christ will have an expiration date. So why are we looking so hard to have these things fulfill us? Why is that? Because they're temporary. They will not last. They have an expiration date, but yet we're in pursuing of these things. So my question to you this evening is, what are those things that you're pursuing? If we're not resting in the eternal love of Jesus Christ and allowing his love, his eternal love, to bring fulfillment to us, we are, we are pursuing things that will expire. 
They will never bring fulfillment in our lives. They will never bring an eternal perspective in our lives. Only our hope in Jesus Christ. We see the perfect example of a man who was fulfilling his life with temporary things because in the second part of verse 2, after supper being ended, it says the devil have already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. This is a perfect example of someone who has pursued temporary things for fulfillment from the world, and yet he had access of greater than anybody to the eternal love of Jesus Christ. Think about it. Judas walked with Jesus many miles. Judas was around those campfires with Jesus, hearing his heart. Judas was the one that was there when he would see the dead come back to life. Judas was there at the Last Supper, but yet his heart was full of greed. And he was after those temporary things. And so what is so dangerous about this is that this person, Judas Iscariot, had so much close access to Jesus, he still was after the things of the world. See, friends, if we are not in pursuit of God's love through his word, through the fellowship of our uh, believers and in prayer, we can be so close to Jesus in proximity, but our hearts can be so far away from him. Judas was the perfect example who pursued temporary things, even though he had direct access to the eternal love of Jesus Christ. His pursuit of greed led Jesus, Judas to betray Jesus, and this is what happens when we look for fulfillment outside the love of Jesus Christ. We will begin to give our lives over and betray our Lord and Savior. When we think about all the things he's done for us at the cross, but yet we decide to do it our way, or we decide to do it this way, or we think we can get away with this, or you know, I, I you know, I've been serving God for a little bit of time now, so I del I deserve a little bit of this, and I deserve a little bit of that, and ultimately, what we're doing is that we are betraying the very love of Jesus Christ. So, what are you seeking for fulfillment this evening? What are you pursuing? Because if it's outside the eternal love of Jesus Christ, it's temporary and it will never bring you fulfillment. Matthew 15, 8, it says, these people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Nothing will ever bring fulfillment outside the love of Jesus Christ. Everything is temporary. I like what it says in Isaiah chapter 54, verse 10. It says, for mountains may depart and the hills may be removed, but my steadfast love shall not depart from you my covenant of peace shall not be removed, says the Lord, who has compassion on you. Psalm 103, 17 says, but the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him. Jesus knew that Judas would betray him. Judas is mentioned eight times in the gospel of John, more than any other gospels. Satan had entered into Judas and now he would give him the necessary thought to bring about the arrest and crucifixion of the Son of God. What's interesting here when it says, and, and the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, that word in the Greek, put in, really means to throw. And so it was thrown on the heart of Judas. And when our hearts are seeking after those temporary things, it's very easily for the enemy to throw these things on our hearts. I'm often asked is, was Judas a believer? Or was, has he always been a member of Satan's family? He sat under Jesus' ministry for three years, was a part of the inner circle. Again, he's seen miracles, but yet he was under the control of Satan because of his pursuit of worldly things. And his plot against Jesus was nothing less than satanic. But verse 3, it's an amazing verse, you guys. Look what it says. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given him all things into his hands 
and that he had come from God and was going to God. This is an amazing verse because just alone in verse 3, we are seeing the deity of Jesus unfold be before our eyes. It says Jesus knowing. What's, what's so amazing about this is that Jesus in his earthly form is now taking on the deity characteristics. He knew is knowing. It's an ongoing thing. As he says here that knowing that the Father has given into the hands and that he had come from God and was going to God. In other words, God has given Jesus all authority. All authority. Not just some authority, all authority. Now, I don't know if you guys ever had any run-in with the Huda, right? Or the cops for you. And they have authority. They can arrest you. They can take you to jail. They can do a lot of things. And some of us don't like that. So sometimes we will rebel against that authority. But it's telling us here that all authority was given to Jesus. And he knew this. He knew this. He knew that his death was coming within the next couple of days. And, and it's telling us here that he has all authority, given us the characteristics of his eternal, is that he was omnipotent, all-knowing. This is what I love about verse 3 because it's building the omnipotence and the eternal aspect of Jesus. It tells us here in verse 3 that he's going into, he, it come from God and he's going back to God. tells us the eternal relationship between the Son and the Father. Another aspect of Jesus' deity. And this verse also shows the eternal relationship between the two. And it tells us here in verse 3 that he had come from God and was going to God. He knew that his identity was in God, that he was God himself. So you see that verses 1, 2, and 3 have given us this unpeeling of the deity of Jesus. He uses the word, John uses the word, and he knew, and he loved eternally. And now he's omnipotent. He knows all things and all authority has been given to him from God. And now he's going back to God. Isn't that amazing? The, the description in these first three verses of Jesus. When we take the time to look at that, we're thinking, this, wow. All authority has been given unto him. How much authority has been given? All. So when you read this, you're thinking, now Jesus has all this authority. You know what he's going to go do? He's going to go out there and overthrow the Roman government. Right? All authority has been given to him. Jesus, go out and, and, and destroy Pilate and destroy the governors and destroy all of Rome and, and get that occupation out of Jerusalem. Get him out of Israel. Or you know what, Jesus? Judas is a treacherous be, uh, betrayer. Zap into a chicharron. Get him. Take care of him. But what does he do? All authority has just been given to Jesus, and he knew this. Look what it says in verse 4. He rose from the supper table, laid his, aside his garments, took a towel, and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. He rises up. You think he's going to start rising in power and he's going to lead this, this coup and go out there and take care of things, but instead he rises up and he removes his garment. What's so significant about him removing his garment? When you look at, and I'm jumping ahead of myself, when you look at John chapter 19, verse 23, it says that the Roman soldiers divided his garments and gambled for him. That verse tells us that it's a, it was a one seam, seam, it was a seamless tunic. And that the Roman soldiers wanted to gamble for it. 
So there's a little bit of significance of what this garment is. Actually, it says garments. See, most rabbis would, would in those days, would wear a seamless garment. Yet Jesus was not rich. And a lot of times the Bible tells us that a lot of the things were supplied to him. And, and one of the commentators pointed out that a robe or his seamless garment may have been given to him as an indicator of a high authority. But it was with no pomp or circumstance. It was just a seamless one seam robe. But it was significant enough for people to identify who he is with that robe. It was enough for the Roman soldiers to want to gamble for it at the side of the crucifixion. And the first thing that he does when he's just been given all authority is he gets up and he removes that garment, which removes himself as having all authority. And he pours. He begins to pour. He begins to wipe the, the feet of the disciples with the towel. In Jewish customs, there was no way masters would ever wash the feet of servants. Gentile slaves would typically do that. But Jesus knew within the disciples that there was some type of competitive spirit that was going on. In fact, within minutes of washing the disciples' feet, when you look at Luke 22, you'll see that they begin to argue who's the greatest. And Jesus perceived that, knowing all things. And he begins to deal with that. He gave them an unforgettable lesson in humility, and he rebuked their selfish pride. The more you think about this, the more profound what Paul writes in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11, let, not, let this mind be in you which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider robbery to be equal with God, but made himself with no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of man, and being found in the appearance of man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God has also highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on earth and those under earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Sovereign Jesus, all power has just been handed to him. All authority has been given to him. And the first thing he does is he rises up and takes the role of a servant to wash his disciples' feet. Now, I don't know about you guys. I would never wash your feet. I've seen some of your guys' feet. If I put my feet in there, I, I've, I was, I've seen these places where you can put your feet in these little things and all these little fishes would eat it, right? If they did that to me, all those fish would be floating. <laughs> and imagine the dirt that was on the towel of washing their feet, how dirty it was. He, yet Jesus removes his garment and he, and he puts on this towel and he identifies himself as a servant. And what's interesting about this is that Jesus removes his deity, his garment of deity, and he has taken on the dirty sins of our lives in order that we may be set free. And he laid himself his garment. And he girds himself with the towel. And the first thing that John tells us he does is he pours. Jesus had been pouring into the lives of his disciples for the last three and a half years. He poured his life into them and he poured his love into them. And now he is pouring water into a basin to show his disciples the most ultimate demonstration of love, servanthood. And the next time that we will read of Jesus pouring out will be while he's on the cross, pouring out his blood because he loves you and he loves me. Psalm twenty-two, fourteen says, I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It melted within me. What's interesting here in verse 5, it talks about he poured water into the basin and began to wash. That word means to wash just a single part of the body. 
the distinction was he was trying to teach his disciples that by washing your feet, that we are called distinctly to walk a holy walk and that we are to keep our feet clean in order for us to walk worthy. Because if we're defiled, we cannot have communion with our Lord. We can't experience his eternal love that brings fulfillment in our lives as an example to love and to serve others. How we do in that area? In serving one another. It's hard. It's difficult to serve one another. But why don't we follow the example of the eternal love of Jesus Christ? You know, earlier I mentioned that there was a time in my life where Thanksgiving was not a good time for me. As I mentioned before, because I was alone, I was strung out, I was addicted, I, I, I had made poor choices, and now I'm, I'm, here I am sitting by myself thinking that just an hour's family is going to get together and I'm not going to be there. And I don't know about you guys, but that, I don't know if you guys ever experienced that type of loneliness. And again, this was a time, the idea of being loved and being thankful was something that was so foreign to me, so far away from me. And I remember coming home on a Sunday before Thanksgiving, and as I walked through the door, I was strung out, I was angry, and I walked through the door, and my dad meets me there, and he begins to try to encourage me that, son, your life is not supposed to be like this. Jesus loves you. He has a plan for you. He has a purpose for you. Son, turn away from these things. And what I do is I get up and I push my dad down on the floor. And I can tell you, friends, that I've never, ever forgot that look in his face. Never. He was shocked that his son would do something like this to him. And as I saw him on the ground, tears started to stream from his face. And I'm thinking to myself, what have I done? And the look that he gave me, that confused, stunned look that his own son has just pushed him to the floor. I remember leaving there thinking I can never be loved. I can never be forgiven. When he died at his deathbed, as soon as he took his last breath, that was the first thing I thought about. And it still burns my heart and my mind. But it reminds me of a story, and I'm going to close with this, because God's love and his eternal love for you, he has forgiven you for everything. I love what it says in Ephesians, but God. You guys, many of you guys have heard this story before, and it bears repeating because it's, it, it's a picture of God's eternal love. A man had a mutt. A, a man had many dogs. You guys know this one. Many dogs. And these dogs were purebred dogs, and he would take these dogs to dog shows, and they would win first place prizes. And because of this, this man became very rich. And yet, these dogs really did nothing for them. He tried to have a relationship with them. He tried to he tried to spend time with them, but yet these dogs really didn't do anything for them, but just won him money and, and trophies. You'd go into his fireplace, and he had these trophies of first place, and they made him lots and lots of money, but there's no relationship with them. And he told his servant, you know what? I want to go out and look for a mutt. And his, his servant is like, what do you mean you want a mutt? You have all these dogs right here. They've won you tons of money. They have done so good for you. Why would you want to look for a mutt? Because they do nothing for me. I love them, and they do not respond. So they get in the limousine, and they're cruising up the highway and the byway, and it's pouring rain, and they get to a, an alley, and they look down the alley, and the man says, stop the car. And as the master gets out of the car, he goes and there are there is a mutt that is digging through the trash. This mutt had no home. He had been kicked out. He had been hated. 
He'd been beat. He'd been stepped on. And so as this master is approaching this dog that is left to dig through the trash, he goes and picks him up, and the mutt is very timid because it has been beaten before. And the master picks this mutt up, holds it close to him. It's wet. I don't know if you guys ever smelled wet dog. Whew. And he puts it in the car and takes it home. Meanwhile, this mutt's like, this guy's going to throw me out the window. Everybody else has. Nobody has been good to me. Everybody else has done me wrong. And the master takes this mutt home, and he gives it a warm bath. He lets him eat out of his bowl. And he loves this smut. He gives it a bath. He warms it. He feeds it. He lets it, he lets it sit on his lap while they eat. They, he, he sleeps with it. And one morning, the master gets up, and the mud is gone. And the master couldn't understand why the smut would leave after he had poured his heart into this dog. And every morning, that master would go, and he would go on the highways and the byways looking for his dog, and he could never find it. And so he gave up. Much time has passed, and one morning he hears a scratch at the door, and he's thinking, maybe that's my mutt. Nah, it's been too much time. There's no way that dog would come back. I went looking for it. It's gone. And he heard it again. This is while he was eating breakfast. And the master gets up. And he starts to walk quickly to the door and his, his walk begins a brisk jog and his brisk jog became a sprint to the door and he opens up the door and guess what he sees? Come back next week and I'll tell you guys about it. His mutt. His mutt came home. And this time his mutt brought a bunch of mutt friends with him. And he turned and spoke mutt language to these dogs and said, this is the man who loved me when nobody else would. This is the man who loved me with an eternal love. This is the man that when I pushed my dad down, he forgave me. This is the man that when I was strung out, he's the one that set me free. This is the man that when I had no hope and wanted to take my own life, that he gave me life. This is the man. Amen. This is the man who loves you eternally. See, friends, there's nothing in this world that we can pursue outside the eternal love of Jesus Christ. May we always remember that in this Thanksgiving season, that Jesus loves you with an eternal love. Never, never forget that. May we always walk in his love because he loves you. I hate to say this, guys, but we're all mutts. And we all have a story when Jesus set us free. Amen?